they send me stuff man you know a lot of times if i'm doing a lot or, or just working or doing something with the kids and necessarily can't necessarily always make the rehearsals they'd send me to them and i'm listening and i'm like because i like to play what the bass player plays That's right my mm -hmm. but that's on bass just gotta, gotta be just, and at the time i didn't have your number mm -hmm. you know, i definitely called you man or text you with some choice words like, time where everybody just wanted to every church you walk into was singing the israel uh song right for praise and worship right right <laughs> it goes it goes both ways for me because growing up having to play both of y'all songs <laughs> oh, we don't we don't lift him up today what <laughs> i ain't playing no kind of slap i'm 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 gonna leave i'm gonna lay out <laughs> Since you, you mentioned that, man, that's one of the things I've always appreciated about your style, man. I feel like, now me and Kern, we definitely, you know, I mean, you can't play bass without playing finger bass. That's, that comes a given. But you got this way of moving on the bass, man, with your finger style of playing, man, that's beautiful, man. And I feel like so many people um, play like that because of you. I really, I really wow. believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I hear it a lot, man, and I always think about you. Know, I was like, Justin started that. I, I was always interested in the arts, you know, so my mom, when I was a kid, she put me in anything that was arts, you know, dance, visual arts, music, and, um, and uh, like I was saying earlier, in, in, the fifth, in, in the fifth grade, you know, they gave us, you know, this sheet, you know, with, with different instruments, you know, choose the instruments you want to play, and um, first was drums, second was saxophone, and, and the very last was trumpet. And of course, they gave me trumpet. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and um, I just, I just, I fell in love with it. I remember the kindergarten teacher 
from my from my elementary school, she pulled me aside and she said, I want to I want to show you this VHS. And it was a VHS of Miles Davis. And I was like, oh, wow. Well, and I, I immediately clicked like I clicked. I mean, it's, it's a black guy that plays trumpet. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so that was like the first seed, if you will, you know, that was kind of put in me. It was like, okay, wow, this, this guy is amazing. And I'm playing trumpet. And um, I didn't do a lot of video games. I just practiced every day. We, we want to go all in. So. Shout out to mom. What's your mom's name? Her name is Sandra Rains. Sandra Rains. Mm -hmm. So was she singing in church or anything or? Uh, yeah, she sang in the choir. You know, she wasn't, She's not a singer, but you know, <laughs> she sang in the choir and everything. You know, I grew up Kojic. Um, okay. Actually, man, it didn't hit me until years later. My very first session, attending a session, and I really wasn't into music at that time, was James Moore, live in Pittsburgh. Were you always playing the, uh, um, well, I was gonna say Tobias. <laughs> Were you playing the Tobias first? No, um, so as my professional bass, if you will, yeah, I've always played MTD. Um, um, my very first bass was a Yamaha BBG five string. Pass it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. And, um, uh, and what's funny is I got it. My mom got it for me my tenth grade year of high school, um, and I wanted it because it was blue. It was blue, and it had like black stripes on it. I didn't know anything about electronics. I didn't know nothing about preamps or nothing. It was blue. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta so, stop with it because it's blue, man. Huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and as I did like a little bit more research, I found out that it, it was like the passive version to Nathan East, uh, to his signature model base. Mm. Um, it was just a lot cheaper, of course. And, um, but, <laughs> but, but when there was time for me to, you know, upgrade my base, I was in college and at the time I didn't want to follow the crowd. So I didn't want a fender, which I kind of regret now because I because because I want to get a fender now. Like I, I've got to have a P bass. I just if you're cutting <laughs> records, you gotta have a P bass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um but uh but I I didn't want to follow the crowd of, of a fender. Um one of my big influences starting out was Maurice Fitzgerald, because everywhere I turned Maurice Fitzgerald was on a record, you know, like, like in my generation coming up. And I remember seeing him play a Warwick. So I was like, maybe I'll go get a Warwick. Um, and I liked the thumb, but the neck was just too heavy. And I was like, man, this, this neck is heavy. Like I'm kind of lopsided. And I remember going to GMWA and I was maybe 14, 15. And, Which um, look, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> GMWA to 2019 or like, <laughs> 2012. Man, this, man, this had to be this had to be 99 or 2000 GMWA. Oh wow! And, and, and I was playing drums, and uh, and Goucher was on bass. I didn't know who he was. I was just playing drums, and I was like so in awe of this guy's bass playing. He was like, man, man, stay in the pocket. I'm like, oh, oh, I mean, you're killing on drum. You're, you're killing on bass. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, oh, and then, the man. That, that's kind of how I, I was introduced to MTD. And um, while, while I was at Berkeley, you know, rest in peace, Tim Rob Biz Williams, you know, we, we, we grew up together in GMWA. And um, I always played his basses when we were in college. And I was like, man, there's just something about whenever I, I hold an MTD, it just feels comfortable, like without hearing it, without playing it yet. I, I just kind of just put it in my hands. It just felt comfortable. So, um, so my first pro professional base, if you will, has been MTD, and I've been been with Mike since since then. Yeah. Wow. You still have your first one? Uh, unfortunately, I don't. Um, around around 2012, um, this was like in the middle of, of time when I was like really sick. And I had to sell it. I had to sell it. Uh, so I called Mike. I actually sent it to Mike. I sent it to Mike so it can be repaired, you know, make it look brand new. And I said, you know, you know, what should I sell it for? Because at that time I had, 
I had this one right here. He made this six string for me. And, um, and, uh, and, um, since I already had a six, I, I had two six strings. So I was like, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and sell this one. So, so I sold it to a guy down in new Orleans who still has it actually. Um, um, but I don't have that first one. That brown one that I see behind you, I, mm -hmm. I see that. I, I think I see you play that one a lot. Yeah. So this one, this one is like, uh, Man, I've had this one for since 2008, I want to say, 2008. And um, I, I, I played this one on most of the records that I've done, with the exception of Alive in Asia with Israel and, and the William McDowell records. So all of those were, were played on my Saratoga. But like all the Israel records prior, like Deeper Level, um, uh, Jesus at the Center were played with this, with this six string. Which, um, with that bass, which one of the records of William McDowell were you using, played later? Oh, I was, I was playing, playing my signature. I was playing uh, Saratoga, which inspired my signature. Um, my little cousin, he, he's holding that right now amazing bass player he um wow he he works with adam blackstone and um what's his name he his name is mikhail scott but he goes by simba okay ah. and um incredible amazing amazing bass player so he's he's holding on to that saratoga but that saratoga i i played i played on the alive in asia record um on It's, it's funny um, when you when you froze, Zoom said uh, Kern is now the host. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's pretty dope. That's yeah. pretty dope. And and it's funny. I was trying to get to that that William McDowell. I wanted to know which um, which which one of the I think you did two of the, two or three of his albums. So I did I did three of the albums. Um, uh, on two of the albums, I played uh, a Saratoga, and and that bass I played on Sounds of, Re of Revival and Sounds of Revival Part Two. On the Cry, the one that came out last year, um, inspired by my my Saratoga actually. Okay, so, pretty, pretty. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, this one is on the Cry, and it's on uh, William Murphy's uh, Settle Here, and and Israel's Road to Damascus. Yeah, so on The Cry, I would say there's a song called uh, Finished Work. Um, I think it's sitting nice in the mix on there. And uh, yeah, Finished Work. And now I will see. It's already done. It's already done. 
What Jesus accomplished on Calvary is already done. Everything you believe in God to do in the future was accomplished for you at Calvary. 2,000 years ago, every promise we need, the healing that we need, the freedom that we need, the grace that we need was already purchased. We didn't come here to labor. We came to walk in it. We got a generation who's going to learn how to rest in the finished work. That's why we say the work is The title of that song is, is, is really interesting. Um, like the spin that the way I'm thinking about it is yeah. you have a testimony of your own, right? Absolutely. Your life. And so I feel like when you, when you play songs like that, um, do you, silly question, but I'm gonna ask it. I already know the answer because it happens to me. You're ministering to people, but the song is ministering to you. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Um, I mean, like I said, because I have my own, because I have my own testimony. 
talk a little and, bit about uh, that. Um, so um, I tell people all the time, I play the way that I play because of the things that I've been through. You know what I mean? So that's, mm -hmm. that's what people, that's what you feel, you know, whenever you, whenever you hear or experience, you know, me play, um, I'm playing from a place, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not playing from, you know, notes, if you will. I know what the notes are, all that stuff, but I play from um, where, what I've been through. So hearing, so specifically this song, the work's already finished. It's like, it's already done. You know what I mean? Like literally, it's it's a it's a literal statement. It doesn't you, you don't have to look deep into it. It's literally already done. You know what I mean? So there's there's plenty of songs, man. That whenever I play or I, I'm ministering it to the people, it's it's that God's downloading it right back into me, which makes me want to minister it even more. <laughs> You just did something on the bass that was like a, a, a it answered it. Yeah. From yeah. yeah. Wow. You, almost as you saying, you just don't understand how done it really is in my life. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. this is my way of saying, yeah, it is already done. Absolutely. And you <laughs> fell right back into the, you know, Absolutely. and 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 that's where and some people might scream and go, woo, and this, that, and the other. And then they come up to you later and go, man, what was that that thing you did, like in a concert or something? You're like, man, I don't know. And they and they don't, don't. and they don't believe you sometimes, right? They're like, come on, man. <laughs> like, like, and it's funny you say that because I was that guy, you know, when I was younger, where I would see, <laughs> where I would go up to a guy like, hey, man, like, what was that? And they're like, I don't know. And to me, at a young age, I'm like, oh, you're just being a jerk. You don't want to, you don't want to tell me what's going on. But as I got older and, and go through my own life experiences and, and I minister through song, it's lip, like I would try to go back and relive it. Like, okay, did somebody record it? Like, what happened? <laughs> like, if, you, if, if, you, if you play it for me, I can tell you what the notes were, but right. I can't tell you why it was put there. I can't tell you I was thinking of this. Yeah. I was, or, or if I was thinking, it had nothing to do with music. It right. had everything to do with the message that was going on at that particular time. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're adding your feeling and, and your, your, you know, you're ministering, but you're testifying through your music. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have, you know, we don't have mics in front of us and mm -hmm. scream out, it's already done. But yeah. you're going to feel it's already done through what I'm playing. And that recording was so clean sounding too. Oh, like yeah. it was just super clean. Everything, drums, everything, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, man. Thank How you. How long man. did you uh, did you tour with with uh, William as well, or? Um, I did a lot of uh, the international dates. So he's he's you know William McDowell is humongous around the world, mm -hmm. um, especially in the continent of Africa. So. Whenever he would go to Africa, he he, uh, he, he would often take me with him um, on those particular trips. I didn't really tour. Um, I would do, you know, dates here and there with him, but but mainly international dates and then the records um, that um, are played out. You know what's funny? <laughs> I was thinking of, uh, you know, how, 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 how Reggie Parker talks about uh, songs that have, like, bass, bass intros. Yeah. And I was thinking, I was like, man, almost every record that I've played on, there's been a bass intro. <laughs> oh, wow. Just about, man. Like, um, it's like more melodic and more subtle, if you will. Um, there are more so ballads, but there's a few records that I've done where the bass starts it. I remember when I first started with Israel and, um, and <laughs> uh, I was kind of all over the place just, Chords, chords, chords. <laughs> I'm gonna use all all of this six string. I'm gonna use all of it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I remember being, we were in, I wanna say we were in Indiana or somewhere. And he's like a big brother to me now. Like I do life with him. Uh, uh Jerry Harris. And um Jerry Harris was looking at me, he was like, Hey man, uh you sound good. Yeah, you sound good. But do all of that down here. <laughs> you know, oh my goodness. I'm young. I'm like, how are you gonna tell me, man? I'm I'm playing bass, you playing ox. Oh, what you mean? I'm just young, just, just young and dumb and just just at the mouth. But I was like, you know what? 
you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like conversations like that and, and you know, having, having mentors or, or guys, you know, speak into me and me being willing to hear it, me being willing to accept it. I'm like, okay, I got you. I got you. I'm going to go and work Black Street with him. Yeah, yeah. Did, Black we did some Black Street together with mm -hmm. Jerry. Yeah, Jerry's, that's the man. <laughs> man. The bass players that do, you know, between gospel, R&B, or whatever, but that do both key bass and electric bass. There are other key bass players out there as well, but I was like, man, this is perfect to have wow. these two together for, for many reasons. Yeah. I will praise you forever. Only you can satisfy. to Johnny Natural. Oh yeah. So Natural Natural did all the programming for uh, for that song. And <clears throat> when I was playing key bass, like I have I, I have the utmost respect, you know, for Natural, like the whole like the whole funk rock orchestra, like Natural, Valdez, Aaron Spears, um, Buddy Strong. Buddy, yes. And, 
and Terrence Palmer on bass. Me and Terrence Palmer split that record. Um, shout out to Terrence. And yeah, that's shout a, out to Terrence. That's a whole another story. That, like, that, like that, the, that, the reason that, why I'm even where I am, <laughs> Terrence Palmer. <laughs> yeah, that's another Detroit boy right there. Yeah, Terrence Palmer. <laughs> but Natural was like, hey, man, um, on the first part of this song, it's reggae tone, man. I need you to give me a nice sub synth bass. I was like, yes, sir. He said, now, when they get to the vamp, I need you to open up. I said, yes, sir. So he like, <laughs> he like produced me <laughs> on, that, on that record, man. My first uh, pop star was JoJo uh, when, when she was like 16 years old. Um, uh, Ray Chu was the MD and I, I auditioned in Boston and, um, and you know, we, we did like all, all the TV shows. So like Jay Leno, Megan Mullally, Good Morning America and all that stuff. And her, her records were heavy, were like heavy key bass. And, um, and I was just starting out. So another shout out to Mitch Cohen, you know? Oh, yeah. and so, so when I originally got the gig, my, my home church, my home, uh, my, my bishop back in Boston, Bobby Perry, they were going on like a, like a local tour. So it was like, I got the gig, but I committed to the tour first. So I had to, so I had to give up the gig. And I just went, I went on tour with, with my pastor. And wow, that's after big. the tour, after the tour, I got called back. You know, Mitch was like, yeah, man, I didn't, I, I think Mitch did uh, something with, uh, with JoJo and, um, and MTV, like the Teen Choice Awards. And then Mitch was like, all right, Justin, man, it's yours. <laughs> and, um, but in the rehearsals, Mitch, he showed me how to use the MS-2000. I mean, he, he ran me through, you know, how to build certain sounds and stuff like that. So my real start in synth bass was with JoJo. Yeah. So were you kind of that same, in that same vein, or you had no interest in keys at all until that happened? So actually, I did little. So I went to a performing arts middle school and high school, and piano was a part of it. Like that was a part of the classes. So you had to take piano. And my, my principal um, instrument was trumpet. So I played trumpet for years. Um, Ain't that something, man? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I just, you know, all these bass players, man, <laughs> the first instrument that they thought was their primary instrument was not bass. Yeah. Gouche's first instrument was trumpet. Well, mm -hmm. he thought it was going to be trumpet, as he put it. <laughs> and, I played trumpet and I studied, I was blessed to study with some of like some jazz greats, like, like John Faddis. Uh, and Pittsburgh, like, like Pittsburgh has a huge jazz community, or at least when I was growing up, they had a huge jazz community, jazz, jazz festivals. And trumpet was the last instrument that I chose, but I just gave my all into it. And that was, that was my main instrument for years. And it wasn't until 10th grade um, we had like six or seven trumpet players and n n uh, none of our upright bass players wanted to play jazz. They all, they, they all wanted to play classical. So our guitars, our guitar teacher was playing bass <laughs> in, in all of our jazz quartets and stuff like that. And I'm like, man, we got, we got plethora, of, like, got a, like a lot of trumpet players. So I'll, I'll learn bass, <laughs> you know, and that's kind of how it started, you know, in, in 10th grade, like as far, because there was, there were no electric bass students, like all the bass students wanted to play classical. They didn't want to play jazz or anything else.
can do it. Mountains moving. You can do it. It's easy for you. You can do it. Mountains moving. Grooving like crazy over there. So mad at Israel for not calling me for that record. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go in that order. So as far as music and 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 will things go back, I don't know, but I will say when it when it comes to that having your own product like something there's something that you do that you're good at figure out what that is you know for me it's teaching like i've always been a teacher i love to teach um i have a company uh, j range lessons that you know that i've been that i've been teaching for past 10 years um uh base students <clears throat> um Actually, Andre, that's in the comments. He's he's one of my he he's one of my uh, students. <laughs> um, nice. Um, but for me, it's it's teaching. You know, I I love to teach. I love to share. You know, and and whatever that is, if it's producing, if it's if it's being an artist, if it's whatever it is that that's in that line of music, because I know some people they don't want to leave the vein of music, and you don't have to, because there's so many different things that you can do with the music. Um, um, but finding that thing that you're good at and, and expound on it, man, like, like really dive into it and own it. Everything that's going on today, like it's so fresh, but then again, it's, it's, it's always been fresh for me. Like I've, I've been pulled over. I've, I've, I've been handcuffed. I've been, I've spent a few hours in the jail cell, you know, because just because of, hey, you're driving a black truck. It's got black tents. You're a black guy and you got dreads. You know, you're, you, you fit the description. Like, why did you pull me over? License and registration. Why did you pull me over? License and registration. <laughs> it's two o'clock in the morning. Ain't nobody out here but us. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but, man. It's it's a it, it's a hard reality for me because I have a son as well. You know what I mean, and and I have to explain to him what's going on in the world today. And if I'm talking to any musicians out there, it, it, it would be the same thing as to my son, as far as man, be the best person that you can be. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I truly believe the energy that you give off, it it will it will definitely come back to you that and, yep. and i use things like you know it i pray that you know whenever I, I walk into a room that the presence of god that's with me helps change the atmosphere within the room without me having to say anything and it's not a clout thing it's not a it's not a, a, an arrogance thing like when I, when i come in contact with you i want your mood to be better than what it was i'm just I'm going to always exude love. I'm a communicator. I'm going to be fair. I'm going to listen. And if mm -hmm. I don't agree, I don't agree. I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> that's just, <laughs> that's too much energy for me. <laughs> that's, that's, it's too much energy to argue. I'm just going to be like, okay, cool. You give Keston a lot of credit, but I wanted to interrupt you and be like, great job, dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, don't forget, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I get it. <laughs> It's definitely just a, a reminder of the things that I've instilled in him. Right. I'm like, man, that's right. You're right. You're right. I love you, man. I appreciate you, man. You're definitely the talent, clearly, behind lots of hits, lots of songs. You run off, have you gone on tour with any R&B people really quick? Neo, we did. I was with him for about a year and a half. I just want to say to Justin, man, Justin, I really love your plan, man. Such a great, great guy. Got a chance to hang out with Justin at the NAMM show with a uh, Bubby Lewis, like Bobby. about about two years ago, man. And, and those guys were just amazing, man. I just wanted to let you know I really appreciate you, man. Great guy, great player, man. 
man, much thank respect, you. Justin. Yes, much, man, thank you so much. Like, um, like I said, like in the beginning, um, I to to sit here in the virtual room, you know, <laughs> you know, with you guys, it's it's uh it's in, it's incredible to me, man, because that's. I'm a part of the generation that came up listening to both of you, watching both of you. Um, I remember being being in college, and uh, and Reggie's CD just you know magically magically showed up in Boston at Berkeley, <laughs> and I'm really? like, who is this? And what I want to say it was it was his song "May I." Oh wow! And that was that was my introduction to. Reggie, Reggie Young, the bass player. Like, of course, I heard the the, the, the James Hall records, the Heads records. Um, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Out of um, is it Delaware? Um, boom, ba dum dum dum. Craig Hayes. Craig Hayes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, do 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 do. Come on, man. I know all. <laughs> All that stuff, but um, <laughs> your when your record it just you no know, like it showed up in Berkeley, man, and I remember listening to May I, and that changed. That was like, so we have like pillars in our lives. We have like moments that like switch our playing. That for me, that was one of those moments where it switched. I'm like, this guy has mimicked all of his influences to the T, and then at the end was like, all right, now listen to Reggie play. You know what I mean? You've heard, you've heard John Petitucci, you've heard Jocko, you've heard Victor, you've heard Marcus, you've heard Stanley, now here Reggie. And I'm like, wow, okay, okay, got it, <laughs> got it. So out of that entire record, it was May I that like just switched everything for me. An official thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> for, for what, well, one, for what you just said, you know, in terms of my, my May I record, which that was like 1996. In the first record that I did, there's a long story behind that, but yeah, Kern, and and like you couldn't have phrased that any better. Yo, they <laughs> were running. I mean, look at look at the. Uh, I don't have that wallpaper on that on my wall that he has on his. <laughs> look look at that wallpaper, man. Right. <laughs> oh, so sad. <laughs> there was a song called. Restoration. Restoration Come on. Is finally come. Now wait a minute. Y'all gonna have to move on this one. Let me hear some hand clapping. We're getting ready to go home, but before we go, we like to say, restore me. And what would I know about mercy if I had gotten out of it? I said, Restoration, Restoration, the final letter. Let's go back to my place and say it again. I said, Restoration, the final letter.
gentlemen kern just that's all oh, he's just he's he's one of those guys you know like jordan when you say jordan y'all know who jordan is <laughs> <laughs> just say kern you in the music industry and say kern as a matter of fact uh there was a comment in here earlier someone wanted to know where the name kern came from um uh, actually it was a nickname my grandmother gave me uh Kern is not my legal name, but my grandma, we used to, back in the uh, day, she used to like this cereal called Captain Crunch. But my grandma, she used to call it, so she used to call me Colonel Crunch. <laughs> because whenever she went shopping, I said, you just make sure you get some Captain Crunch cereal. If you don't get nothing else, get that. And so she would bring that, and she used to call me Colonel Crunch, so they started calling me Kern for sure, because of the cereal that my grandma used to buy me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And you've done way more than Justin and I probably put together. Right? Yeah. I'll just, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> your, your TV stuff includes the Oscars, the Grammys, the Man. Tonight Show, Late Night, Ellen, Oprah, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you've, you've toured with Lady Gaga, Beyonce, yeah. Mary J. Blige, also Neo, like Justin as well. Yeah. Uh, Closely, check it out. Uh, Chris yeah. Brown, Destiny's Child, and then your records. One of them, you know, we just heard with the whinings, man. Like, but you also did records with Thomas Whitfield, Vanessa yeah. Bell Armstrong, Will Smith, <laughs> LL Cool J, 98 <laughs> Degrees. <laughs> you know, man, what, what was it like, man? You know, and just being born and raised in Detroit where, you know, like you even mentioned Maurice Fitzgerald and, and all of these amazing musicians, man, like, man, Detroit for, for gospel was booming, man. Oh my goodness. It was so much fun back then. Cause I used to go, Clark sisters used to be at Bailey Cathedral and we just had a midnight musical at Bailey's Cathedral. So you can go to Bailey's Cathedral and you'll see Vicky Winans, CC Winans, Karen, Twinkie, Dorinda, and then Fred and Mitch and those guys who come in. So we were all, you know, Mike Wright, Earl Wright, Eric Bryce. It was Detroit was just kind of one of those cities that a lot of black churches here. It's a lot of um, a lot of black people here. Yeah. Uh, you know, Detroit is like a black city, and so every corner you would find a church or a singer or a group. And then we're all heavily influenced by James Jameson and Motown yeah. because of this the whole legacy of Motown and growing up here, just hearing that stuff and being around it. So I just think, you know, Detroit is just one of those places where we're, we're not East Coast, we're not West Coast, we're not South. We're kind of like, they call it Midwest. Right. So we're getting, we're getting influences from New York, we're getting influences from the South, and we're getting influences from the from, uh, West Coast. So it was just kind of like a nice milk pot for just musicians. And uh, me and Valdez, Val is a, is a big Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea fan. Like, yeah. you know, and then, and then um, his mentor and one of my mentors is Greg Killing Gangs, who's wow. from Detroit as well, who's music director for Michael. And then Nate Watts is <laughs> like my, Nate Watts is like my uncle. He's, he's everybody in Detroit's uncle, Uncle Nate. <laughs> so, you know, being around Nate Watts and Ricky Lawson, Justin, I know you know about Ricky Lawson and Greg. It's like, so all these guys are like right here, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it was just uh, amazing to be able to be around so much talent. And just as a kid growing up, watching Ricky and watching Greg and watching Nate Watts and uh, Ray Parker Jr. and those cats, man. And, it, and Thomas, with, and Thomas, that was my first time as the co-producer. Tommy, I love him so much because he gave me credits and he allowed me and Jonathan DuBose to produce and write on that uh, first Jolanda record. Thomas blessed the whole city. <laughs> like he just blessed all of us here, man. Mike Mendegar, a lot of us, all the musicians in Detroit came up under with him. So like, we're all like this. Yeah, you mentioned. I remember you mentioned that, man. And I thought that was so incredible. You talked about how musicians would just kind of go and hang out, you know, like yeah. around his house or whatever. And around his house, just rehearsals. Whenever the choir was rehearsing, you would look in the back of the church, and that whole back row would be full of keyboard players just sitting back there taking notes. So Tommy, Tommy could have could have probably been the gospel Motown of Detroit. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. If he would have started a label, Thomas Whitfield Records. Oh, right? yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Imagine. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And he, he's the middle man. He introduced me to Marvin Winding. He introduced me to Twinkie Clark and Eric Bryce and all of us, man. All of us was just, just go to Tommy's house, man, and just hang out. <laughs> So he did, I didn't, you know, it didn't even dawn on me. So that Yolanda Adams, the I am, mm -hmm. that's you. In the mid '80s, this guy's doing that. All right. <laughs> what was I doing in the mid '80s? Did I even pick up the? I, was I playing bass yet? <laughs> on wax, I, though. Yep. Yeah, what'd you say? I said on wax. He's doing it on wax. You know what I said? On wax. Ain't no Man. overdub. Which, yeah. which bass? Which bass was that? Uh, four that I think that was my Fender Jazz four string. That joint. Uh, Seventy-four. Yeah, Seventy-four Fender Jazz. Got rid of it? No, I still got it. Oh, you still have it? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. So you're not like Steve Huff. He just was giving everything away, all his baby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like that Fender, man, I haven't been able to find that tone. That Fender Jazz, I had EMG pickups on it, the Badass Bridge. And I yeah. think I had um, or the D the D tuner, I think it's called a D, a D drop, something. Drop the D, the E to yeah. D. Yeah, I had that put on there. So they yeah, had hip shot. In the eighties, they had those. Yeah, yeah. yep. There's a music store out here in Detroit, uh, that Boosie Collins, because you know Parliament Funkadelic. That was another reason why we kind of had a lot of funk in there because United Sound Studios here in Detroit, and that's the P Funk Lab where Bootsy and Roger and George Flynn and Gary Scheider and Bernie Worrell, they cut off Flashlight, One Nation, all that stuff was cut here. So we used to. Um, skip school and sneak up to the studio and try to hang out with Bootsy and them <laughs> as oh. kids. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. Did you do that You Know That I Know album with Yolanda? No, no, I just I just did just the first one. I did. You did Nobody But Jesus? Yep, yep, and uh, Peace Be Still did that one. <laughs>
And kept me from all danger. The way a father can. Who was the one? Such a class. With nails in his hands 
<laughs> so many great you know, memories, man. <laughs> hey, what was it like? Where did y'all cut that session at? We cut that at this uh, small studio in Detroit called RMJ Studios. Um, um, uh, and a lot of, Tommy, we recorded a lot of stuff too at the United Sounds as well. Same studio as probably Funkadelic. So some of the mixing was probably done at United, but we did a lot of our tracks at this little studio called RMJ. Um, yeah. Was it, uh, how was it working with Tommy on, on, on song? Was that Tommy, did Tommy write that? Did Vanessa write that or? Um, Thomas wrote it. Thomas wrote it and arranged it. But uh, work like um, Thomas was a teacher. He was a teacher too. So we would have rehearsal with just the rhythm section. Then we have another rehearsal with just the lead singers and another rehearsal with just choir and background. Then another rehearsal with just the engineers and the technical people. So by the time we actually went into the studio, every section of the song was well rehearsed. And yeah. Tommy was really a perfectionist when it came to it. Even with the bass, if you notice, I don't move. I move a little, but not that much because he didn't really like the bass to be moving around too much because of the movements in there. But every now and then I would sneak a little run in there or a little push or something. But I tried to stay pocket as much as possible through a lot of those sessions. Tommy was very, Tommy was very jazzy, right? And yeah, yeah, very jazzy. Tommy wasn't, he wasn't playing to be seen, to be noticed, to be heard or look at what I can do. Like he was, his songs were written around his playing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure he could have did, played, really overplayed those records if he wanted to, but he wasn't. He was just putting the color where he wrote it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't a necessarily. It's not like he's trying to make it about him. He wants even what you do to stand out. When you do it, yeah. he wants it to be nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, if, definitely. If we all doing it at the same time, then it's, it's not. You know, somebody's yeah. gonna get undercut and like, oh, whoa, they all stepping mm -hmm. on each other. So give me this spot, you find your spot. And, and that's, that's, that's what I got from most He actually people. helped me to understand playing with other musicians too, leaving that space and not being all over the place. And uh, after working with Whitfield, it, it kind of led me because I started playing with Earl Clue, jazz guitarist from Detroit. And then later I got the gig with um, Grover Washington Jr. Mm. And even more recently playing shows with David Foster, I just, keep reflecting back to all the stuff I learned from Tommy, how to just anchor that pocket, how to be really solid on the low end. And then when needed, you know, you throw in that little run here or a little push there, just your little signature thing, but come back to that pocket to make the whole sound, the whole accompaniment feel full with the bass at the bottom end. Man. Right. What was some of the Vicky Winans music that you did? Uh, she had a song called uh, Honeycomb. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Play for a group, man. Yeah, Honeycomb. That was, I, I liked it because it hit a nice little melodic bass line at the intro. So, uh, and it was one of the first songs I had to learn to play. And that was so hard for me to learn. Because it flips, the beat kind of flips a little bit on the bass line. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a mixture of jazz, gospel, funk, and RB. And that's Detroit. Detroit is like a melting pot. And, and you can. I mean, you can hear the analog throughout that entire record. It's so warm, but the bass is like, is <laughs> right there, like sitting, like sitting right there in front of your face, man. And it, everything is played with such precision. And like, I'm just like, I'm like, how can I duplicate that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it had a lot to do with a lot of the great engineers we had up here. This guy, Mike Icapelli, and uh. Another guy, um, what was his name? Warren Woods, another yeah. amazing um, engineer from Detroit, man. Who did a lot of, I'll keep going back to Funkadelic because a lot of these same people engineered for Parliament P Funk, George Clinton as well. Yeah. But, you know, the home studio engineers, I don't think understand this concept. Um, to hear an instrument back then, mm -hmm. it wasn't about turning the faders up to hear the instrument. It was about spreading the mix out. Yeah, and EQ and EQ. The EQ and the mix, EQ. spreading it, get, and that's it. Get, get the kick drum off the bass frequency. Mm -hmm. Give them their own frequencies. Now, all of a sudden, like, 
okay, I want to hear a little bit more bass. And so somebody's going to reach the, to the faders. You go, no, 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 no. Leave the uh -huh. faders right there. EQ that out. And you go up and start EQing the frequencies. And then all of a sudden, you're looking at the en a, a good engineer. You're looking at mm -hmm. them like, how'd you do that? And they yeah. understand frequencies, the shapes. You can, these days, we're fortunate enough to look at them as shapes. But, right. you know. Right. Right there, you got to set it. You, the blend, the key word is blend. Blend it right in there, right in that mix with that vocal sitting there and then everything else. Is That's what it is. Switch a little bit to uh, the Will Smith record. Big uh, yeah. uh, What was that? Yeah. yeah, oh, it was awesome, man. I was in New York. I happened to be in New York during that period, and I got a phone call um, from this producer, and he said that uh, Will Smith wanted some musicians so i went into the studio and we i cut the song big willie uh it's called get jiggy with it what yeah oh my god yeah get jiggy that with was it you? <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that was it <laughs> get jiggy with it that was the record and uh it was wow. so funny because will smith he came in the studio when i was recording and he said something that was so funny like i mean i just started cracking up through the whole thing man and he invited us to come out after the session but uh, yeah, I played on like maybe seven or eight songs on that record, Big Willie style. Get Jiggy with it was the, was the number one record on that album. <laughs> Just being in New York at the right place at the right time, man. Wow. You know? Detroit, man. You ain't even supposed to be on that record, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, back then, uh, Northwest Airlines had a special. You could fly from Detroit to Newark, New Jersey for $75. Wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, they had a one-way ticket to New Jersey for set. So every time I heard about something in New York, I would just go to the airport and, and, and fly into New York and find a place to crash out in New York. <laughs> one, of the first times I, one of the first times I saw you, man, I was at um, uh, Rocket Studios. And oh, yeah. And you and and Valdez, I believe, had I don't because they used to rent gear too, right? They were a big rent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Backline. Company, yeah, yeah, yeah. When y'all were there for something, man, and 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 I saw you, I had no, that's why you kept coming to New York to get on all yeah. the records. Yeah, seventy. Yeah, because nothing was happening in Detroit, and I was like, well, all the auditions are in L.A. or New York, and New York was closer. And then I had friends there, Flip, you know, Joe Flip Wilson, of course, Joe my brother, Flip. Gerald Hayward. Yeah, Lauren Dawson and Jeff Motley. So I had cats in New York that I knew through Tommy, you know, because all all the church cats kind of all knew each other. We knew Jonathan Dubose. We knew yeah, yeah. Reggie Parker. You know, Jeff Lowe Davis. So yeah. it was kind of like, you know, they was like, just come to New York. Don't worry about it. You sleep on the couch. Yeah. All, right, all right, I'm on the way. Yeah, yeah. Four hours later, I was there on the couch. Like, hey, I'm here. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Are yeah, you that was serious, a man? Like <laughs> that was a fun session. That was the summer jam, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it was a it wasn't but God, man. It was a blessing just to be in New York that week. Justin, I'm not like you right now. I'm just like <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Was that baseline there already, or they wanted you to create it? The baseline. Oh, no, that's that's the that's the baseline from I wonder why uh, Nile Rogers and Bernard Edwards. I wonder why she's the greatest dancer. Uh, Chic. Okay. I think it's Chic, but yeah, Bernard Edwards. That's his baseline. I just copied it exactly like he played it. I was getting ready to ask that same question. I was going to say, did you make it up or, or? Uh, 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 that was from the master, Bernard Edwards, the man. Now Rogers, that was them. It's always been a a a, uh, a scramble for a hot bass line. Like they'll call a bass player to come in the studio, and they was like, "Yo, I need something hot right here." Like, and then and then, and then the hip hop guys are funny, right? Because they'll be sitting there trying real hard to hum something to you, and they be like, <laughs> real high. Sometimes they like, doom 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 doom. Do, do, do. give, give me that butter, son. I need boom 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 boom. <laughs> Eddie Murphy had a song called, an uh, album called, called So Happy or something. And it had that, that one record on the album called Put Your Mouth On Me. <laughs> so I played on uh, some other songs on that album too. And it was weird because in New York during that time, they had uh, all these sessions happening. 
mm-hmm. during that time. You know, I just kind of fell right in pocket with the guys that was producing the tone and folk. Um, and they just kept calling me back and forth for more stuff. And I, I don't even think they knew I didn't live in uh, New York. So I would be flying home and then coming back. And you did and, uh, the uh, LL Cool J Phenomenon? Yeah, I played on that album. It was a, a song on here called uh, Father Figure, which was a, which, which was a remake of a George Michael song. Almost like a gospel feel on that one. Real pocket bass, because you know, with, with those sessions, especially then, we would just play the part. That's it, no ad-libs, no, yeah. no feels, nothing, just the note. That's, and, that's what it is, that's what most time yeah. was. Right. Yeah, that's what time was. And, and a lot of people, you know, they were disrespecting, you know, they were trying to say, you know, hip hop and rap and this, that, and the other. But yo, man, they they weren't just stumbling on these grooves and these in this music. Yeah. A lot of them they were recreating. Yeah, yeah. And hip hop, you gotta know when not to play. That's the secret. Know yeah. when not to play. When to just leave that space. Yeah. Play that note and pull out and then it and just make it solid and clean yeah. and consistent. Yeah. And they're not really interested in a lot of chops and licks, but they kind of look at like you're making it sound jazzy or, you know, and every uh, genre has its place. So tell me a little bit about Aretha Franklin. Oh man, the queen of soul, man. Well, Thomas Whitfield, once again, he introduced me to Aretha Franklin. Aretha, Thomas, um, was hired to produce Aretha Franklin's live uh, album. And she wanted this album to be traditional church. Drums, organ, piano, that's it. And then Tommy was like, well, I got a bass player. And then Ms. Franklin said, I don't want no bass. I just want drums, piano, organ. Wow. So Tommy said, look, he said, come anyway. He said, don't worry about her. <laughs> I'll take care of that. Come anyway. So I got to the I got to the church like an hour early before everybody else. Hurry up, set up in the corner, like you know, kind of like behind the drums, kind of in there. So <laughs> we, we, I got my levels straight. I had my basses in tune. Everything was great. Got good levels. So Miss Franklin comes in, and uh, she comes in, and we start playing. I think it was some "Walk in the Light." We recorded "Walk in the Light." She did that over. Uh, and she turned around and looked at me, and and then she, and then I was like, "Uh oh, here it is. I'm about, to, <laughs> I'm about to get the boot." And then she said, "You can stay." And uh, after that, yeah, she said, "You know what? You can stay. I like the bass. I want bass." Tommy looked at me, gave me the little wink, like, "Yep, yep." That's and right. That, That's after right. After that, it was history, man. <laughs> I, I was so nervous, man. You know, and then I was in the studio recording with her one day, and a funny thing happened. Um. I had a question because Aretha, she plays the uh, piano, so she was has real heavy on the left hand. And when you're a bass player, Justin, you know, when you're playing with a piano player, you got to watch that left hand. And she would always change the notes. She'll play it one way this time, then she'll come back and play it another way. So I asked her, I said, Aretha, what note are you playing right there? And she said, it's Mrs. Franklin, Oh, first of all. <laughs> and then I said, oh, Mrs. Franklin. What note are you playing there? Good okay, that's a B flat. So you made a correction and reaction. Yeah, and it's been Mrs. Franklin ever since. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yeah, but I love her, man. I appreciated her, man. I got a chance to do tribute to her here in Detroit before she passed away. And I got to talk to her and she thanked me personally, man. And I just got a chance to give her a big hug and just tell her that I loved her and everything she's done for music, not just here in Detroit, but in the whole world. Jesus is the light of the world.
that's what she wanted that church that old school church feeling not yeah. too much just right there right but i was yeah i was i was nervous because i knew like you said i knew she didn't really want a bass player there so i didn't want to try to be so overbearing that she noticed that like hey you over there you know so i said let me just sneak under that group <laughs> And play the note and get in there and get out of there. <laughs> wow. But yeah, I was super nervous though, man. It was a, it was a lot of pressure there. It was a lot of people there, and I think um, Jesse Jackson was there, and the Mighty Cloud Joyce was there, and the Staple Singers was there, and half everybody in Detroit was there, and it was like, hey, <laughs> play the bass and get it. <laughs> wow. Right. Yeah, it was just a blessing, man, for Tommy to even think of me putting me on there like that. Absolutely, that was awesome. man. That was man. Explain a little bit of, the, of your wallpaper behind you, man. Like, what, what are we looking oh, at? Oh, the wallpaper, let's see. Well, yeah. look, look, look at them. <laughs> it wraps around my room. No, a lot of that, a lot of guys don't know that when you, when you actually play on the tour, you are promoting the record sales. So you are actually, like with the say the Destiny Child, I got a plaque from the Destiny Child tour because we promote the record sales. Where some of these plaques are from um, me playing bass on the record. And then actually I produced a couple of songs, like the Winers plaque. That was from um, from the, the writing and production. The Neo track was from the tour. Young Jesus from the tour. Uh, and then a lot of the gospel stuff is from the tour. But most of them, you get, they got a thing called concert awards. So you get an, you, you're supposed to get an award for every tour that you do. If it goes platinum, we took it platinum. The band took it platinum because they, people who might not have been a fan of a certain artist, they come see the show and now they go out and buy that record. Yeah. So we're contributing to those sales of that record. So it's just, you know, I've been collecting because at, at the end of the tour, the money's gone, everything's gone. You want something that's, to remember of that time when you were there with that artist. I can't say enough how much I thank you, man. And I had to have you back to do to do. Oh man, thank you for this opportunity, this, Bridget. This was, I really this, was a, this was a part two. So if y'all want to see <laughs> kind of like the first half, there's a lot. There's a like Goucher would say, there's a lot of records current on. Current is on. We 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 played about maybe three, four of them on the one or, or uh, with Gooch and and Steve Huff. And then I had yeah. to have him back. What would you suggest, man? Um, I'll leave, let you leave it with the same. I'll leave you with the same question that I gave Justin. Um, I don't know if you knew, but for the past two years, I've been touring in China. Ooh. Yeah, I've worked for artists in China, JJ Lin, who's like major pop star from uh, Singapore. But we've been playing stadiums all about throughout China for the past two years, like 40,000, 50,000 seats every week. And um, so we were kind of like, I was actually in China when we first caught a wind of that was going on. And thank God, uh, it's so amazing that I was able to get out of there and come home, make it back home safe to the U.S. But um, talking to my friends in China, China is kind of getting this thing under control. Like our tour is actually scheduled to take off, back off uh, the beginning of the next year, the Wonderland tour, JJ Lin. And this was the tour Sanctuary, Sanctuary 2.0 mm -hmm. tour. So I actually been working in China for the past two years. I'm actually over there trying to create a market for us. Because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a ton of artists in China and they all want that R&B gospel feel to their music as well, arrangements and recording wise. So it's a whole, it was a whole new world opening up over there for us in Asia to uh, go back for, you know, Joe Otis was the drummer over there with me, Troy Loretta, musical director, uh, Andre Frapp also was from Detroit. Um, you know, we've been just flying back and forth to China, but I feel like here in the U.S. it's going to be a while before they open back up and we get back to full capacity. In Detroit, you know, it's funny because like Detroit, we had a riot here in like, I think in the 60s, 67 riot, where they kind of pretty much burnt down the whole city. That's why everybody was like, Detroit is so raggedy, because a lot of houses got burned down. 
So, so we finally just now getting back on our feet. Like, it took like 30, 40 years just for us to get back to having a viable downtown yeah. and, and companies opening back up because Detroit was also bankrupt at a while too. So we're not in a hurry to burn down and tear up the city again because it took us 40 <laughs> years to rebuild. <laughs> that ain't gonna happen. Everybody's like, you know what, we're gonna hold up on that one and yeah. you know, we're gonna find <laughs> us as musicians could kind of help to kind of let everybody feel good again and know that we're all right, we're united. There is no, uh, yeah, man. there is no, I don't feel racial tension when I'm in the bandstand. Yeah. Whether I'm, no matter what country, even in Russia or wherever we are in the world, you know too, Justin, from traveling around the world yeah. yourself, you don't feel that. You just feel love and the energy from the people. Yeah, like not many people know, but, um, I got the opportunity to be the backup basis for the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Wow. Wow. CSO, so yes. I was with them all November, rehearsals, watched, the, watched them build the stage and everything. They, they reached out to me out of nowhere. I was like, this is a- Wow, that's amazing, bro. This is a rock band, progressive rock band. How would y'all find me? And, yeah. <laughs> and I get there, it's like 300, 300 member crew. Yeah. Maybe, maybe about 10 black people. Mm -hmm. but it was, I felt more love there than I would probably feel anywhere else. Wow, yeah, Listen, exactly. Tell the truth, you feel more love there than sometimes you do around your own people. Man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not throwing shade, I'm just talking the truth. <laughs> yeah. You feel a little more safer. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah, it. And, and I want to invite both of you guys to come out to Detroit one day because we do the Detroit Bass Day out yeah. here where we got like 250 bass players. Last year we had Gabriel Severance and Jason Leopold and we had uh, Bobby Vega has been here. And um, when do y'all, when do like we, We're doing it, this one's going to be August the 1st. I think we're going to go virtual this year. We might do it online this year. So I'll be reaching out to you for some. Yeah, man. Yeah. I watched all the pictures. I watched the group pictures of all the bass players oh. in Detroit in front of the um, Motown. <laughs> yeah, there's like 250 bass players, man, and we all give tribute to James Jamison. He's like the founder of, of the whole Motown sound, that bass. I just need to understand, like, I'm like a kid right now because <laughs> one, just all the history, like, I'm just, I'm just really, really like sitting back and learning. Um, I didn't know that Kern played Get Jiggy with it. I, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, like, he, he literally, we, we, we literally just, dis just displayed the all around bass player. Like, you, you, you show gospel, you show R&B, you show hip hop. He, he, he's got K pop behind him, you know, <laughs> and he kind of like, he like skipped over, you know, David Foster, you know, he, he, <laughs> Threw that in there real quick. And kept oh yeah, well, yeah, Mr. Foss, that was another blessing situation. And I, I, I give all credit to God because, you know, I, I, I don't live in LA or New York, so just to have those opportunities yeah. to be there at that time, I know that ain't nothing but God that put me in that place at the time. And David Foster um, is the one that put together the band for JJ Lin in China. He's the music director and the wow. overall director of that tour. And uh, absolutely. Right. All right, gentlemen. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Justin, it's a pleasure, bro. We got to hang, man. Sir. Absolutely, man. Thank you all again. Thank you, Reggie, Kern. Thank you. Thank you. All right, brother. All right. Peace. All right, Thanks, man. guys. Peace.